仔细诊断每一个孩子，评估及追踪他们的需求。Dr. Meiser 在美国行医超过三十五年，是研究小儿肿瘤及血液学的专家。十九年前来到台湾，向基督徒救世会收养了五名具有先天性多重障碍的子女。充满爱心的 Dr. Meiser 和妻子，在繁忙的工作之下，不但亲自照顾孩子，协助改善孩子健康状况，更为他们开启一扇希望之门。Dr. Meiser, welcome to Taiwan and welcome to Good TV. What made you decide to come to Taiwan this time?、Uh, I came to Taiwan this time、mm -hmm. for our the 25th reunion of the Christian Salvation Service,、oh. as well as that to bring two of my children to meet their families. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And everybody say, you know, you have a very beautiful tie today. <laughs> well, thank you、uh, uh -huh. very much. These are. Uh, this is a tie with children、mm -hmm. uh, on it from many countries, so、mm -hmm. it's the children of the world.、Mm -hmm. So it's very suitable for today's topic. So we have to wait back to 19 years ago. And、uh, how did you get involved with CSS? We were very interested at that time、mm -hmm. in adopting children with challenges, with disabilities,、mm -hmm. and God had touched our hearts, and we became aware of a little boy. Who was in a nursery?、Mm -hmm. um, who was in need of a family to in which he could grow up,、mm -hmm. and that turned out to be our Daniel.、Mm -hmm. So we pursued the、uh, adoption of Daniel, and then met、uh, the people of CSS、mm -hmm. uh, through that adoption process. So that was how we first learned about the Christian Salvation Service.、Uh -huh. After learn about Daniel's situation, why did you make up your mind to adopt him?、Uh, almost immediately, my wife and I、mm -hmm. saw his picture. He's a very, very cute、mm -hmm. uh, young boy, and、uh, we felt that that was something that we could help him with. My wife、mm -hmm. is a physician, and I'm a physician, and both of us have some experience with children as pediatricians. So we felt that we could had opportunity and abilities to help him. Uh, with his prostheses and with his health.、Mm -hmm. how, how old was he at that time? When we first learned of him, he was less than a year old. When he first came into our home, he was thirteen、oh. months. Oh, that little. He oh, he was very little, very very cute. Oh, so you still remember the first time you you saw him, right? Ah,、uh, absolutely.、Um, he I first met him、uh, in an airport when he was brought to us, and. He was very active, little boy. Very,、uh, seemed to be very happy. He didn't appear to have any jet lag、uh, from his trip. <laughs> and then、uh, he was with me, and I brought him home to、uh, be part of the family and see his mother. 
and I'll never forget the first time he saw his mother. Uh, he uh, wrapped his arms around her uh -huh. and wrapped his legs around her, uh, and uh, they have been very, very close ever since with a very strong bond and a very strong love for each other. Mm -hmm. But what was the most difficult part in uh, nursing Daniel? Uh, initially, the um, probably the most difficult part was he has a paralyzed uh, face, mm -hmm. and so the making sure that he was well um, exposed to people and that that he would be emotionally supported. Because when you have a paralyzed face, it's hard to understand your emotions. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that he was psychologically supported and cared for. Um, his overall health is quite good. So uh, the other challenging thing for, him, for me and for him is to pr be able to provide him opportunities to do things that challenge him as a person. So mm -hmm. we gave him many opportunities to do things that... Uh, many people would say he couldn't do, but mm -hmm. because he looks like he has you will a disability. You assume this kind of kid that cannot speak, cannot walk, but now Daniel, he can speak, and he, he can walk, can speak. and he can we, do a lot of things. That's right. One of the more challenging things for us has been to make sure we provide him the opportunities and not say, no, Daniel, you can't do that, but rather say, Yes, Daniel. Okay, now. <laughs> but there's always a risk. Then we will see how we can do that. Uh huh. So he likes gymnastics, which is always we always worried about that. But he's better coordinated than most children, so he's very good at that. For mm -hmm. example. Mm hmm. But before you adopted Daniel, you already have uh, many children in the United States, right? Uh, we did. Uh, we have. We had five adopted children before Daniel. Uh huh. So Daniel was our sixth child. Uh huh. And the some of the children before Daniel were also had disabilities, were and also had some handicaps. Uh huh. So uh, they are from different nationalities, right? They, we have some American children, three American children, and mm -hmm. two Korean children, mm -hmm. and then five. Chinese children, and Daniel was the first child from uh, Taiwan. Wow! But w w what was your motivation to adopt children? Well, my wife and I had always wanted to have children, mm -hmm. and after we did our training as uh, physicians and mm -hmm. pediatric oncologists, we thought it was time to ha start a family and we discovered that we could not have biologic children mm -hmm. so we quickly felt that we wanted to adopt children oh. and now we're quite happy that we couldn't have biologic children because we're very very happy with all of our mm -hmm. adopted children but how, how did you feel um, I mean I mean the first moment uh, when you found out you couldn't have your own children When we found out we couldn't have our own children, I, it really wasn't devastating to us. Mm -hmm. it, it might be for some families. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't for us because we had fairly quickly understood that we should adopt children. We felt that it was God's plan for our family to adopt children. So we might have even adopted children anyway. Mm -hmm. but. For us, it was not a devastating experience. It wasn't. We weren't even very sad. We just knew that that was the way it was, and then we decided to go ahead and begin the process of adopting children. Mm -hmm. We didn't plan to adopt ten uh, at the beginning, <laughs> maybe five or four, but uh -huh. not ten. But God led us to adopt each one. He, each child was brought to us. In, uh, by God, He brought us understanding that we should adopt the, uh, each one of them individually. Mm -hmm. So, we I think initially thought we would have one or two, maybe <laughs> four, maybe five. You can then, the six. Uh, then one by one, one by one, to ten. and the seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, they are all Taiwanese. 
right? Six, seven, eight, Six, nine, seven, ten, nine, ten. All, all, all Taiwanese, yes. <laughs> so can you describe a little bit about um, the other four Taiwanese uh, kids, their uh, conditions? Um, certainly. The seventh child we adopted is mm -hmm. uh, Stephen. And Stephen has a syndrome called the EEC syndrome, where EEC. his skin is uh, not uh, normal in its development, and as well as the sweat glands and the hair and some of the uh, structures in the face and ears. And so that's called ectodermal dysplasia. And then he's missing some fingers on his hands and his mm -hmm. feet, so that's called ectrodactyly. Mm -hmm. And then he has a bilateral cleft lip and mm -hmm. palate, and that's called the clefting syndrome, so the EEC. Mm -mm -mm. And then he also uh, was missing a, a kidney and had some very, very serious life-threatening infections early on in his life. And he was probably one of our most challenging children, and he uh, could easily not be alive today, but God's hand has clearly been on him, and I, again, believe that God brought this little boy to us. Mm -hmm. So he, poor fellow has two doctors for parents, you know, and we always check him every night. Uh, oh. e even here in Taiwan this week, I check him at night and say, are you okay, Stephen? And he said, yes, Dad. Oh. And so <laughs> so then, I, then I know he's okay. And so we check him every night, make sure he's all right. Uh -huh. uh, but he's been very healthy over the last mm -hmm. few years. And he's had uh, around 50 operations on his hands and his feet mm -hmm. and his kidneys and his bladder and his face and his ears and his eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but in spite of all that, he's, I think, fairly well-adjusted, happy young man, strong, uh, very smart. So after Stephen, you have a Rachel. And then we have, after the two boys from Taiwan, we have uh -huh. three girls uh -huh. and uh, very wonderful blessings. Uh, Rachel is now 17 and she has a syndrome called the Nagar syndrome and because of that she's deaf mm -hmm. and she has a very small jaw mm -hmm. and so she early on in her life had difficulty eating and breathing and required a significant amount of medical intervention at the uh, Christian Salvation Service nursery mm -hmm. and the, and uh, after we brought her home, we also had to ha have her on a what's called a tracheostomy to help her breathe. Mm -hmm. But in spite of that, she seemed to be very determined to live. And, so, and now she has done quite well, and she's now in her last year of high school. Mm -hmm. um, I emailed with her this morning, um, so she types quite well, and she's quite alert and quite happy. And so she wants to know when she can come to Taiwan. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's uh, very interested in her roots. She's very interested in where she came from and seeing mm -hmm. her country as well. Mm -hmm. um, she's very interested in uh, babies and small animals. And so she's, I think, planning either to work with uh, animals or with young children for her mm -hmm. in her life. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And following with um, Ruth and Elizabeth, right? Right. So Ruth is 14. <coughs> she is probably our mm -hmm. most challenged uh, child medically. Uh, she had a condition called extrophy of the cloaca, which is a developmental abnormality that happens very, very early mm -hmm. in uh, life that in embryologic life and so she was missing her abdominal wall and the skin and the muscles that cover the abdomen and as a result when I first saw her all I could see right into the middle part of her body and see her organs and in addition it's a, an abnormality that doesn't the body doesn't close the body usually has two halves and closes together and in the back and the front, this closing happens normally in the bones and in the nervous system and in the abdominal wall and in the structures. So she's missing um, important organs in her body, the large bowel. Oh, wow. And she's missing a bladder. And she has a deformed uterus. Mm -hmm. And she had a very uh, an absence of the closing in the back. 
So as a result, she has some weakness in her legs, mm -hmm. and uh, she doesn't have a bowel and bladder, and so she has a, a bag mm -hmm. for what's called an ileostomy that collects the waste that goes through her system. And because of all that, she has to be fed through a tube. Mm -hmm. And in spite of all that, she's a very normal 14-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. How about the, uh, the youngest one? So the youngest one mm -hmm. is uh, also one of our greatest challenges. Uh, Elizabeth is missing her uh, right arm, mm -hmm. oh. and she's missing her right leg and she has a deformed left leg. So you would normally think that she couldn't walk, mm -hmm. but actually we, we've provided her a prosthetic device mm -hmm. on her, for her right leg. And we gave her a prosthetic device for her right arm, but she, it was too much trouble. So she just, she uses the, uh, the stump that, to hold things and to do things with. So she didn't, she doesn't like to have an arm unless, unless she's going out. Mm -hmm. And so she has one extremity, her left arm. In spite of that, she plays the piano, and she writes, and she's very artistic, and she's very musical, just like her bio bi biologic mother, actually. Mm -hmm. And she's um, also quite happy. Um, probably one of the most stubborn young <laughs> people that I've ever met, but that has given her, she's very determined to do things. And so she uh, is going to a normal school. And our, probably our, one of our largest challenges with her is making sure now she's beginning to grow. She's 12. Mm -hmm. And making sure that all the prosthetic devices uh, fit. Making sure that she is supported mm -hmm. as a young lady. Mm -hmm. uh, but she has friends, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. and, and she too is artistic. Um, her mother and I are not very artistic at all. Uh, we were more medical, scientific, and we have all these artistic children. But Elizabeth mm -hmm. is very artistic and mm -hmm. creative. So, what are you, uh, your, uh, the most uh, unforgettable moments that you had with these kids? When we adopted Rachel, we sat down with the family because we always ha already had seven children, and we mm -hmm. sat down <laughs> around the dining room table and we uh -huh. said, you know, mom and dad have been praying and we think there's a little girl that we should adopt and her name is Rachel. Everybody agreed that we could do that. Uh, we could adopt R Rachel and everybody okay. was sort of excited about it. But the boys, and by that time we had six of them, all said they wanted to do just what we did last summer and go on a camping vacation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So my wife and I agreed that we would do that. And so we had Rachel come to us, and then we discovered that she actually needed a tracheostomy, and she had to have <clears throat> assistance in breathing. And so uh, after the spring came, the it was pretty obvious that we weren't going to be able to go on vacation, weren't be able to go camping. So I told the boys that we weren't going to be able to do that, and they said, Dad, you promised yeah. <laughs> that we must go camping together as a family. It was so much fun last summer. We wanted to be together on a vacation and a family. So I ma created uh, a, an intensive care unit in the back of one of our vans. And so we were, took Rachel camping with the rest of the family. And once we would camp and set up the tent and set up all the camping equipment, and I would set, I set up the intensive care unit for, for Rachel so she could have her breathing. So wow. she, she would go to sleep in the back of the van with uh, oxygen and humidification and so that she would stay healthy. And then what was really, I'll never forget, was uh, Rachel then walking in a mountain lake, uh -huh. a very clear mountain uh -huh. lake with her tracheostomy and holding on. It was the first, her first walk in a, in a clear uh, American lake.
电脑，一个先天没有手掌和脚掌，另一个用着残缺的手指，快速的和好友 MSN。他们是 Doctor m i s e r 在台湾所认养的两个孩子 ，Daniel 和 Steven。从小就在国外长大的他们，是典型的美国小孩，喜爱户外活动。打网球、骑脚踏车、溜滑板，活泼外向的个性，对自己充满自信。从小缺陷的身体，并没有将他们局限住，没有双手也能弹得一手好琴，让人惊叹连连。脚掌却能够灵巧的后空翻，如此的举动使人联想到 Doctor m i s e r 是花了多少的心力在孩子身上，放手让他们尝试，做任何事情总是陪伴在一旁鼓舞打气，跨越国籍的界限。Doctor m i s e r 用爱填补了孩子生命里的空缺。Daniel and Stephen、uh, come with you this time to Taiwan, right? Not only they did. because they want to see their hometown, but also they have a special purpose to meet their、uh, birth parents, huh? It's very exciting. They <coughs> they very much over the last year or so were, have gotten more interested、mm -mm. in not only learning about their country, coming to see their country,、mm -mm. but also to meet. People that were important to them in their lives and were related to them and had a hand in their lives very early on,、mm -hmm. and so both of them were had questions and both of them were interested in coming. So this 25th reunion gave opportunity,、mm -hmm. and so they did come with me, and so we stopped in Los Angeles and spent some time with their two older brothers.、Uh, And then we came on to Taiwan, and it's really been a very wonderful、mm -hmm. time for them.、Uh, we met with the their families、uh -huh. on Sunday, and just a few days ago, and they spent、uh, each spent all day yesterday with their with their birth families. Was this was this the first time? And this is the first time for both of them、wow. meeting these people, and it's very exciting for them to meet people that. Uh, from a very long time ago, are still committed to them as people, and they have a love for each other. It's it's really a wonderful thing. Were they nervous? They、Are、were they a little.、Nervous? They were a little nervous. A little nervous. A little nervous. But they were more excited than nervous. But、mm -hmm. they, I think, you're always a little nervous when you meet someone for the first time,、mm -hmm. and you hear you're going to meet somebody that really is pretty important in your life, but you've never met them before. Do they have siblings? So Stephen has two、uh -huh. siblings. He has a, an older brother and a younger brother, and then Daniel has three siblings:、mm -hmm. an older sister, and then another older sister that's closer in age to Daniel, and then a younger brother.、Oh. And there, by now, they will have all met. They will met everyone. The last.、Uh -huh. um, Uh, sister, the oldest Daniel's oldest sister, he just met in the meeting, but now he's spending time with her today. So, so they are supposed to be here today, but you know, because the the, the love of the family, they they want to spend more time with. Yes, I I offered for them to come today.、Uh -huh. I encouraged them to come today. <laughs> I think they were a little embarrassed to come today, but then they they had opportunity to meet. And spend time with their brothers and sisters today,、mm -hmm. and they asked me. They said no. They really would like to do that. How, how do they communicate with the brothers and sisters? The, the of course, my two boys don't、uh -oh. have Mandarin, although they both want to learn. But the their siblings,、uh -huh. uh, they each have one sibling whose English is very good,、mm -hmm. and then、uh, all of the siblings have a, a little bit of English. Mm -hmm. And then two of them have quite good English, so they're they're able to communicate. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, when they met their parents, especially the mother, 
what what were they talking about? They really got. They were really talking about getting to know each other. You know,、uh-uh. what what were their interests and what did they like? And,、uh-uh. But I think most importantly, they realized that they they had a bond and they were exploring the that relationship.、Mm-hmm. But they they wanted. To, they each asked about what the what their interests were, and the siblings their siblings asked the boys what their interests were and what their Skills were and what they liked to do and what they. <laughs> so they were. It was just that、so、kind of conversation. It was, a, it was a very normal、uh-uh. conversation, but、uh-uh. it was also a conversation that had much love in it, mm-mm, mm-mm. and and a, quite a lot of emotion too, because、mm-hmm. it, it was emotional time for the for everyone to suddenly realize that you had someone else that was part of a family. Did you see the mother's tears? Or、uh, both mothers were emotional. Wow, were they?、Uh, were their family amazed at、um, their wonderful state now? I think appreciative.、Mm-hmm. I think they appreciated very much that the boys were healthy and strong and good boys.、Mm-hmm. So I, I think that they、um, grateful. They must be very proud of not only、um, their physical situation, but also、uh, they can see these two boys have very high self-esteem. I think that they—it's not hard to see. They're—they're、mm-hmm. they're very. They have good self-esteem. They're very、um, strong-minded, strong-willed, yes. Yes.、Uh, but also kind. They're very、mm-hmm. kind boys. How, how did you、um, teach them? Uh, day by day,、uh-huh. we, the the most important thing for a parent to do for their child、Mm-mm. is to love them. And love doesn't mean pander to them or to give them everything and spoil them everything they want. It means to do what's best for them and to let them know every day、Mm-mm. that they're loved and cared for, and then give them opportunities to express themselves physically. Emotionally, spiritually,、um, artistically,、Mm-mm. and provide those opportunities, and so that's what we've tried to do. The most important thing is to provide an environment where they feel loved and absolutely secure in、Mm-mm. that love,、Mm-mm. and that really is. I've had opportunity to teach Daniel. I've had opportunity to teach Stephen to play tennis or to play the piano. Uh, to arrange music, to provide opportunity,、mm-hmm. and God has given me some of those skills to be able to do that.、Mm-hmm. But the most important thing is to provide God's love to them, and so we also have taught them about God and to have taken them to church and provided some education for them in both their schooling and、mm-hmm. in Sunday school and in church, so that they understand. Uh, where they came from, and that God really loves them. So it's really ministering God's love to the children、mm-hmm. through yourself,、mm-hmm. through a parent's love.、Mm-hmm. I'm so amazed at、um, Daniel can play the piano without fingers. That's wonderful. But also,、um, I feel even more amazed is、um, they love sports. Like Daniel play tennis and golf, right? Yes. And Stephen like to skateboard. Skateboard and play tennis. Wow! I often see.、Um, we did. Fortunately, the way tennis rackets have evolved, the way they made them,、uh-huh. is that they're made now with a, a little V hole just below the tennis racket head. And so, when I first started teaching Stephen to play tennis,、uh, Daniel said he wanted to play tennis too. So I said, "Well, come on," because I could have easily said, "No, you don't have any hands, Daniel. You can't play tennis." But I never said that. I always said, "Well, come on." And then I said, "Okay, God, how am I going to teach him how to play tennis?" But he has a way of doing it.、Uh-huh. And he's very strong, so he can use this. The design of the rackets、uh-uh. now, and he can hold on to it.、Uh-huh. And at,、uh, I think you've seen、uh, a clip of him actually hitting the racket, and he's very coordinated. So if you're pretty coordinated and you're strong, he can do it. And、mm-hmm. Stephen is missing fingers on his hand, but、yeah. I taught him to play tennis two-handed. So he actually plays tennis with 
two fingers on each hand, that's four fingers, and two thumbs. So he has six digits that he plays with. When I play, I have four fingers and one thumb. So he actually has an extra thumb for me than I do but uh, in playing tennis. So, But it, each one of them, there are some... I have to adjust my uh, education for them or teaching for them how to do each one of these things. And I've actually uh, contacted some musicians, for instance, about how to teach Daniel how to uh -huh. play the piano and asked their advice uh, about how to do it. And uh, a lot of piano teaching is about fingering. Mm -hmm. And since Daniel doesn't have any fingering, it's a lot about how you play. And so uh, I have asked some advice but it's been fun and challenging for me as a father yeah. to help them. It's really been fun. Is it hard for you to say no when they ask, you know, you know, some sports are dangerous? <laughs> um, it, it hasn't been too hard to say no. It, but, you know, for me, they're, they have some disability, so it's always hard to say no. Uh -huh. But we've tried hard if the children want to pursue something to help them pursue it. Wow. Now, if Daniel wanted to skydive, I might be a little nervous about it. <laughs> he hasn't said he wanted to do that, thankfully. But uh, gymnastics, is uh, he is very interested in that. Um, and so, and that has some danger to it. But he is very strong and he wants yes. to do it, so mm -hmm. we let him do it. Mm, but ha have they ever get injured? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, they have, uh, but fortunately not terribly. Mm -hmm. They haven't broken any bones. The, <laughs> they have been in some. Uh, uh, they have had been in some accidents, and they have hurt their legs or their backs. Stephen, mm -hmm. especially, is a bit of a daredevil. So he, especially on the skateboard, and he'll come back home with uh, his mm -hmm. legs sort of bruised and bleeding, and we'll look at him and say, "Stephen, are you okay?" And he said, "I'm fine." And we said. Not even sore. No, I'm not sore, but he. <laughs> so he's very much a boy. <laughs> so I know uh, all of your children uh, learn how to um, ride a bike, right? They, we've taught all but the last two uh, little girls the, uh -huh. that have the. Ruth has some neurologic problems with her leg, so she rode a tricycle. Oh, okay. But the, her balance would not have allowed her to ride a bicycle. And Elizabeth is missing legs, so mm -hmm. she doesn't ride a bike. But we taught all the rest of them to ride bikes. Mm -hmm. And when I first taught Daniel how to ride a back bike, it was actually easier to teach him to ride than it was my firstborn, uh, who has no disability with his arms and legs at all. But Daniel's balance is much better than David's, his older brother. So uh, Daniel actually learned how to ride a bike very easily, and Stephen as well. So they're, but that's because they're very coordinated and have great balance and good strength. Mm -hmm. We saw the uh, video um, tape, as uh, the um, audience can see from the tape too, and Daniel and uh, Stephen are, are um, you know, strong boys, and uh, they have a very good self-esteem. But um, I want to ask, um, do they care? when people stare at them? That, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. They would prefer mm -hmm. that people didn't stare at them. Mm -mm. They understand that as children that have disabilities that are visible, that people are going to stare at them. Mm -mm. They're not tremendously self-conscious, but I think they would prefer that they didn't uh, receive that. But people are people, and the world is the world. So we've tried to help them with that. When I first took Daniel bicycle riding, he, he's rarely fallen off a bike. I can only remember one mm -hmm. time. And it was early on when we, I was teaching him to ride, and he, uh, he fell, and I was running behind him. So it was maybe 25 or 30 yards away, and there were several adults who came over and looked at him. And they were horrified that I had let this little boy ride a bicycle. But I got up and uh, when, I, when I caught up to him and uh, looked at him, he was not hurt. He was wearing a helmet. And so I said, well, Daniel, come on, let's get up and get going. And so he got back on his bicycle and off he went. And I think the, 
the adults that were looking at were just shaking their heads because they they would mm -hmm. they were concerned about him even riding a bicycle. But uh, it, so other my point is that other people have different expectations uh -huh. and would want to protect the children or would say, "Oh, isn't that too bad?" But my children don't oh. feel that it's too bad. They that's just the way they are, and they want to get mm -hmm. on with their lives and do normal activities and go to school and do art or do photography or do sports or do swimming and they just want to be n normal children. But you know, 10 children with you, if you the family, ho the whole family go out, it's ho so hard and you know, the, the people around you ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is very difficult to, for my wife and myself to go out to eat or to go uh -huh. out for an evening uh -uh. because uh, it's almost impossible to find a babysitter oh, yeah. or someone to oh, come yeah. into the family and to take care of them. Uh, we did go away one evening uh, 10 years ago and I asked some friends to come by and they said, oh yes, they would be happy to come by. And they had about five or six people came to babysit. <laughs> and uh, when we got back, uh, later that evening they were all exhausted <laughs> so we uh, th that is the one thing with when you have that many children and uh -huh. that many challenged children we have not uh, gone out mm -hmm. uh, very much do children help each other they do uh -uh. they do especially rachel rachel's very helping she helps the girls uh -uh. Uh, but daniel has developed a very close relationship with uh, elizabeth uh -uh. So Daniel especially likes to help Elizabeth, and Daniel's very strong, so he'll, he'll carry Elizabeth uh, when we go out to the beach or when we go out. Uh, and then uh, uh, Rachel will push a wheelchair for, for Elizabeth when we have to go into town. And uh, Peter, my, one of my uh, young men from Korea, uh, will often go with me and push the wheelchair for Ruth when we go out walking. So they... Um, they do help each other. They're very committed to each other, and I think that's a good thing. They've learned that they're, it's important to help people in their family. So what made you stop at child number 10? And we sat down as a family, the whole family, and uh, all the children, and said, okay, we've done this a couple of times uh, with the children, and, they, and those children were placed for adoption in other Christian families. And they, we asked the children, did they want to have an 11th child in the family or did they want to have additional children? And everybody said, 10 is good, Dad. <laughs> so, that's how, so it really was a family vote and a family discussion, and everybody felt like 10 was complete.看似绝望的生命，却在Doctor 10 children, your uh, financial situation must be very, you know, tough. How do you handle it's it? It's another uh, miraculous thing. I don't know how uh, we've been able to get by f for all these years with that. Mm -hmm. But God has blessed us, and we have, we've always had enough. We've always had enough. The children wow. have had enough. People have helped us, and uh, the, uh, we've often gotten uh, uh, fairly nice Secondhand clothes for them from people, and but uh, the girl, the girls get new clothes as well. So, and we've always had enough. You know, God has always provided us just enough, so that we've never gone without. We've always <laughs> had adequate amount of food and things, and God's but blessed us. Did you ever have a time when you felt weak or tired? Oh, we feel tired all the time, <laughs> <laughs> especially my wife. I think she uh -huh. she has to. Since the three little uh, little ones are not so little, 
and they're girls, and they're actually now 12, 14, and 17, there are certain things that it's not okay for dads to do except in a very emergency. So it's important for mom to be able to do some things, especially around bath time and taking care of them. So I'm uh, very much a second uh, choice on some of the activities. So I think sometimes it's, it's harder for my wife uh, in, in some of the jobs that have to be done in home. So I do some of the other things. Uh, so I would say we're often tired physically, but we're often very joyous and it's, uh, we always have enough energy to get the job done and the children get fed and the children get their teeth brushed and they go to bed and then there's another day. Um, God has always provided the energy mm -mm. to do it. How do you pray for your children? <laughs> you know, I think we just pray like every what other Christian families do. Mm -hmm. uh, we pray with them, usually each uh, one before they go to bed. Uh, sometimes they'll be together. Sometimes the girls like to sleep together in the mm -hmm. same room. Sometimes, they, but we try to sleep, pray with each one of them. I pray with the boys uh, often, and uh, so we have a, usually a special time with each one just before they go to bed. Not not long time because there are ten of them, but, mm -hmm. oh, but that, that's always been since um, since we had children started in the family 27 years ago. We've always spent some time with each one. And what made you stop at child number 10? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, we actually brought uh, several times an 11th child into the family because mm -hmm. they needed some medical assessment. And since Angela and I were physicians, the, uh, in order to have the uh, child assessed properly, we wanted to see, the, see how they were doing in the home. So mm -hmm. we brought it children over you can in america you can uh, have a child come over for a medical visa a medical assessment mm -hmm. so we would have them in the home and assess them and then take them to the hospital and have evaluations so we did that uh, twice and then again we sat down as a family the whole family and uh, all the children and said okay we've done this a couple of times uh, with the children and, they, and those children were placed for adoption in other christian families and they, we asked the children, did they want to have an 11th child in the family or did they want to have additional children? And everybody said, 10 is good, Dad. <laughs> so, that's how, so it really was a family vote and a family discussion, and everybody felt like 10 was complete. Uh -huh. But Dr. Meiser, why did you move from uh, the United States to the United Kingdom now? The reason it, my wife is english oh. and the the main reason we moved at the time we moved was because angela's mother was uh, getting older oh. and uh, we felt we wanted to be closer to her because angela was so far away living in the united states to support her in her last years of her life so we moved the whole family uh, you can imagine moving we moved eight children on the airplane. <laughs> uh, we had to rent a tour bus just to get them from the airport to uh, their, their new home. And uh, it was mainly to be in support of Angela's mother as uh, she was spending the last few years of her life and so that Angela could be closer to her. And that was a great comfort to her mother. Um, her mother uh, was happy not to be in the middle of our family and all the craziness of having uh, eight children, but was very happy that we were close. And uh, my mother also was uh, ill at the same time, and so um, both of our uh, mothers and their, the children's grandmothers now have uh, passed on to be with the Lord. But that was the reason we actually went. And also, it's fair, my wife is English and she'd spent 30 years in the United States. So now um, she has opportunity to be there. But it's a good environment for the children as do, well. Do children uh, like the UK? They pretty much all do. Oh. One of them, Stephen, has said he wants to come back and live in the United States. But that's this year. We'll see. Maybe one of them will move to Taiwan. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Have you ever thought about uh, Steve, Stephen, and um, uh, Daniel um, might come back to Taiwan and leave your family, and maybe they just want to, you know, be there, be with their birth parents and uh, siblings? I, I really have never thought of it as leaving our family. Uh -huh. we, uh, I have asked them if they would like to uh -huh. come to uh, Taiwan mm -mm. and to be closer to their birth uh, family. Yes. But, you know, they're now young men. Uh -huh. and they, have, they can make choices. Uh, at this point, I think they still have some education to complete uh, yeah. in the U.K. Uh, but they were born in Taiwan, have grown up in the United States, currently mm -hmm. live in the U.K. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't spend some time mm -hmm. in Taiwan. And I also think that there's a good chance that they'll want to spend more time with their their birth families, especially their brothers and sisters, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, they uh, cho young people that age enjoy spending time together. Uh, I'm sure also that they'll want to spend time with their, their birth parents. Um, their experience here, I think, has been really a wonderful one. They've, they've felt loved and they've mm -hmm. felt cared for, and it's been a real special experience for them to experience the love of a group of people that they had never met before, but they knew about, and they knew were important to them, but they hadn't experienced personally that mm -hmm. love, and having experienced it is exciting. So I'm not worried that they would come here. Uh, I'm not worried that they would leave. They'll always be part of my life and my family, whether where, regardless of where mm -hmm. they are in the li in the world. Already, my family uh, is in two continents: in the United States and in the UK. I wouldn't be surprised over at some time that they might not be in three continents. Um, since you have ten children, so um, even though um, some of them are, you know grow up already, but you still have a long way to go. <laughs> so for <laughs> the last note, what is the most grateful thing in your life up to date? Wow. Mm. I, you know, God has blessed us so many ways. Mm. Sometimes it's, it would be hard to pick out mm. the one mm -hmm. the one thing. Mm. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to mm. God just for loving me mm. and for giving me opportunity mm. to have these children in my family. Um, we mm. did make the decision together to adopt them, my wife and myself, and sometimes the children. But, and, and that has been, it's been a great blessing to have the ten children. And, and people have, some people have said to me, you know, you know, that's too many, you know. And I said, well, which one would I give away? I couldn't give any of them away. They're all great blessings, you know. So, you ask me, which is the greatest blessing? You know, they're all, each one of them, has been a gift to us. Each one of them has been a miraculous gift mm -hmm. to us. And so just having the, the kind of love that they provide a parent, you know, people often say to me, wow, you have so much to give. Mm -hmm. And really, we've made the decision to have the children in our family, but we have been the recipient of the children's love and the blessing that is without bound and without it's I can't even describe it very well to you how wonderful that is and being this trip is just one small example with two of them and it's been great fun uh, spending time with the boys more intensively so I think the, to answer your question really to experience the love of these children and to have the opportunity to, to minister to them be with them that's probably the greatest mm -hmm. thing in the end I want to say thank you for taking care of Taiwanese children and uh, you have done a great job and we'll come move to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you never know. We, uh, I've thought about uh, whether we might move to Taiwan sometime in the future uh, the, uh, and whether the children might, we, and you never know. God has led us uh, in ways that we didn't, couldn't have anticipated uh, in our lives. So anyway, I thank you for the opportunity for being here. And uh, and uh, thank you for your interest in some very special children. Mm -hmm. 
。如果你也是不孕症的夫妇，也欢迎你来置产。虽然看起来荒芜的土地，很可能会产出你意想不到的果子，就像 Daniel 跟 Steven 一样、哦。Thank you for being here. Hello,好,我是你们的老朋友孙悦。好像人跟人之间是有一些不同啊。有些父母生下来的孩子，有些残缺，但是他就觉得不够完美，他要放弃。但是还有一些，他们就觉得，如果这个孩子他需要的是照